Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Pastor Scott and I'm so excited to have you with us here. Uh, it's just been a, a great thing that some of the youth have requested that we start recording our Wednesday night sermons and so that they can um, catch up on them and review them and if they weren't here uh, be able to come back and watch them and it just blesses my heart so much that we have a group of young people who are so eager to hear the word of God and so I pray that you use this resource uh, in conjunction to being connected and being a part of your local church and um, I just pray that the Lord uses this message and blesses you through it and so please enjoy. We are in our final week of God's word talking about relationships, talking about the do's and don'ts, what they are, uh, how they act. Uh, does anybody have anything from the past weeks that they remember that stood out to them, that sunk in, that made any impact whatsoever? There are no wrong answers unless it's not from a previous week. Anybody? Oh, you guys are breaking my heart. Anything that stood out to you or resonated from the last three times I've been up here talking, anyone? Marlene? Yeah, you guys don't remember when I dropped a television from 25 feet in the air? Come on! Nathan! How God should be in the middle of your relationship. Thank you, guys. Lydia? Dating is an interview. See, thank you. You guys have been listening. Um, Tonight, I'm attempting to do two demonstrations, and so uh, we're going to get into tonight's discussion is, what does God say about sex? This is always the last, uh, this is always the last week that I do for the relationship series. So, first and foremost, did you see me giggle when I said that? No, because it's not awkward to talk about. It's not weird to talk about. This isn't going to be a biology class, so Calm down, okay? We're talking about what does God say about the act of sex? How does he want us to use it? Um, so there's three main questions that usually come with this topic. Why, who, and how? Is why is sex such a big deal? Who cares how I use it? And how is it meant to be used? So my heart behind this series and behind especially tonight is that you will leave here with answers to those questions, that you will leave here with a healthy understanding of what the Bible says, how it's meant to be used, why it was created, and why we make such a big deal out of it. This is, this is what tonight is for. And so I hope... And I, I know in my heart that you guys are mature enough that we can have this conversation and that nobody's going to be giggling and stuff because we're going to get into it tonight. And I don't want to get ahead of myself because the Lord gave me all this. This is not from me. This is from uh, from his guidance and from the word of God. And so I'm super excited about this uh, again. I don't have an awkward bone in my body, and so I don't mind talking about this because the church needs to tell you guys. You're hearing about it, whether you know it or not, whether you want to admit it or not. You're hearing about it from friends, from school especially. Oh, my gosh. Schools talk about this. Now, I didn't go to a, I went to a private Christian school that didn't talk about it, which made it worse because parents, teachers, and things think by not saying anything, they're helping. No, they're not. They're hurting because we as a church want to be proactive and give you the truth. Because how can you combat evil when you don't have the word of God? When you don't know what the word of God says, if you don't know where to look, you guys are young people. I don't expect you to be Bible scholars. I don't expect you to understand how to sift through the Bible and find the answers for particular situations. I, guys, I'm 30 years old and I'm a pastor and I don't get it right all the time. It's difficult sometimes to go through the word of God and try and find the areas that he's talking about specific things. But regardless. That's my heart behind tonight. And so there are some important facts that we're going to just jump right into and get right, right up front. There are three main important facts about sex that I want to just say right off the bat. First and foremost, sex is not bad. Sex is not evil. It is not gross. It is not shameful. It is not something to be afraid of. It is not something to hide. It is not something to be weird about. It's not something to be awkward about. It's something we can talk about. It was designed and made by God the Father himself. So why do we get weird about it? It's because 
over time, we as humans and our sinful hearts have manipulated, twisted it, and turned it into something gross, shameful, and something that we try and hide from God. And we're going to get into why that looks tonight. But remember, first and foremost, sex, not a bad thing. Second, sex is not just a physical act. The world and the enemy will tell you this day in and day out till they die. And it they're going to say, oh, you can just have sex and no, but no strings attached. It's just, a, it's just a physical act. Absolutely not. That is a lie from the pit of hell. It is a spiritual, it, it down. Does it take a physical act to, to enter into sex? Absolutely. It takes two people to enter into sex, a man and a woman, but the melding of two souls. The Bible says that when uh, a, fa- a man will leave his father and his mother and the two will become one flesh, they will, and it's talking about their souls will come together. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but I want to hit home with it. It is not just a physical act. There is a spiritual aspect to sex that happens, and that is why the Bible says, it is meant to be used between you and one person and one person only because what God put together remember the TV what God put together let no man separate remember how we misused the duct tape and then tried to use it in the right way and it fell apart because it was mistreated and misused we're going to get into that tonight again Um, and the third is sex is and was created with instructions and guidelines. And this is what we're going to be talking tonight. We're going to look into the instructions and guidelines that God has created them. Why was, why was sex created with guidelines? Why are there rules and regulations that go along with, with something God created? We're going to talk about it tonight, but I want you to know that it was created with instructions. There is a set of rules that come along with this. And we're going to talk about why tonight, but the enemy and the world is going to tell you, that's not true. You can do whatever you want with it. Lies. I'm telling you now, there is a right and a wrong way to use this gift, and we are going to talk about it tonight. Again, don't want to get ahead of myself. And so, pineapples. Pineapples. Some of you remember this, some of you don't, and those who do, I, this is a refresher course, but I was wondering if I should go back and go over this, but because we have so many new people, and this is such a great illustration, we are going back over this. So, pineapples are incredibly delicious, but first, did you know, yeah, they're delicious, I love pineapples, I will eat so many pineapples, they're just ridiculously good, regardless. Pineapples, did you know that they did not originate in America? That they were brought over to Europe in the 15, 1600s. And when they were brought over, guys, this was a big deal because it, they had never seen anything like this. They were so fascinated by this fruit, people were shocked and awed. Pineapples had become such a a, a a draw for people. They they held pineapple in such regard. They were just, oh my God, it was amazing. And stop it. Now, I just pulled out a pineapple and set it here. And there weren't too many oohs and ahs. There wasn't, there wasn't an ovation. There wasn't a standing crowd. Just, but it doesn't count if I have to ask for it. So my question is, what has changed? And so what I want you to understand, you, you say to me, Scott, no, I, I, I don't believe it. Well, let me, in fact, show you that pineapples were such a big deal that they actually influenced architecture back then, that they became such a pivotal thing that when people had so much money, they didn't know what to do with it. And the very wealthy, we're talking about the 1% of Europe, they started building things and were like, you know what, we need to include this into our buildings because it's so awesome. And did you know that at the height, at the height of the pineapple spike, the most value that this carried, that it equivalates today that you would buy a pineapple for eight thousand dollars that's how incredible that these people actually went and they they had viewing parties you would buy this for eight thousand dollars and you wouldn't eat it you would throw a party and you would sit it on display just like this you would invite your big 
uh, fat cat friends over with all the money, and you would have a party, and then you would just stare at this pineapple. They said that, that to have a piece of pineapple and actually eat it was the experience of a lifetime, that, that, that nothing gets better than that. You're going to be talking about it for the rest of your life. That, that there was actually a service that you could rent these. And you would throw this party, and but it wasn't your pineapple. You rented it. So you want to talk about you want to talk about the the people who live in a townhome but drive a Mercedes. We're talking about these kind of people who rent a pineapple, and then you know when they invite all their their snotty friends over, and they're all like, "Oh, did you hear? Joshua's pineapple's rented." And they're like, "Oh, I know, right? Couldn't even buy a real pineapple." This is what we're dealing with. Okay, there's that much value on this fruit. Because nobody's ever seen one. You can't get one. You can't grow one because nobody's got them. So there's all these, there's a couple of pineapples coming over and people are, are, are doing this. And you say, I don't believe you. Well, in fact, if you would go to visit St. Paul's Cathedral in London, you would see a picture of the south wing on top of the cathedral is, in fact, a pineapple. If you would go to Scotland and visit... Uh, the Earl of Dunmore estate, you would find this building, which is, in fact, a pineapple. If you would go, if you looked back in history, Charles II was a man who became very wealthy. He bought a bunch of land and a bunch of properties, and to commission it, what did he want to be the, the pivotal moment, the ceremony, ribbon cutting? What did he want instead of a ribbon? He wanted to be presented with a pineapple to signify his wealth, to signify his stature and his statement. Guys, this was a status symbol. It was something to be revered. It was something to be uh, held in value. And so... Again, it is, it is incredibly an important part of history that we, that we all too often forget. And so now my question is, what does this have anything to do with, about sex? Hang in there, we're getting there. So why is this so hard to believe today? Anyone? Sadie? Because they're at the ready. I went and got this pineapple from the store yesterday, and it was not hard. I did not have a line. I did not pay $8,000, thank God, because Devin would be very upset. And I actually got three of them, and we're going to have pineapples for snack tonight so that you remember that you remember this illustration. But so why is this such a hard thing to believe? It's because it doesn't cost that today. See, what man made extremely common now lost its value because anyone could have it. See, see, the value from pineapples came from the fact that nobody could get it. So now that everybody could get it, eh, I don't want it. See, humans always do this. The, the saying, the grass isn't always greener on the other side, is always picture a, a, a fence splitting two neighbor's yards, and the, the one neighbor looking over at the other yard, and he's like, oh, it's so luscious, it's so green, it's so beautiful, that guy's so happy, it's because of the yard. And then he gets over there, and he's like, this is no different than my yard. Why did I want this all along? Now that I have it, it was no different than the yard I had. We see this in history with pineapples is everybody's ooing and ah, and this is, this is amazing. I'll pay $8,000. And then they, they bring them over. They plant the seeds. Now we have pineapples out the wazoo. And now everybody's like, eh, I don't want them anymore. They, there, there's no attraction there anymore. This is no different than the way people treat sex today. Something God designed for such beauty and reverence. Something to be shared with just one person in your life. Has now been mistreated, stepped on, overpopulated, overused. To the point where we don't see value in it anymore. 
We don't, you can ask non-believers, hopefully you wouldn't ask believers and get this answer, but you can ask non-believers and say, what does God say about sex? And they would say, oh, they don't talk about it in the Bible because Christians don't believe in sex. They think it's gross, they think it's weird. They have no idea that God designed it. They don't know where it came from. They just, they, we have beaten it and misused it to the point where, you know what we have now? That is a can of pineapple slices that have been processed, misused, and mistreated and have been just gone through the factory and been processed. Now I have, I can, it was either this or pineapple chunks. You want to talk about mistreated and misused? This, this was $1.89. $8,000 for a pineapple, right? How can I hold this in my hand for $1.89? It's because people have overrun and overused pineapples to the point where they're just a common thing now. There's, where's the reverence? Where's, where's the value? Where's, where's the oohs and ahs? Where, where is it holding it in that high stature? How did we lose it? Because it became common to everyone. So what I want you to understand is that when God created sex and he created it between, the Bible says, between one man and one woman, you will be unified. When the, when the man leaves his father and mother, he becomes one with his wife. Adam and Eve slept together the day they got married. God was there. He ordained the marriage. He looked on it with favor. He was happy. He knew this was going to happen. Guys, don't get it wrong. Adam and Eve didn't just come up with this idea. God created them. He created sex. He understood this was going to take place. He married them and said, go and fill the earth. Populate. Do what you were meant to do. And it was good. It wasn't, it wasn't shameful. It wasn't, it wasn't taboo. It wasn't, oh, I got to hide now. I got I got I have sin. It wasn't sinful. It was right. And it was good. Because it was being used in the way God designed it to be used. There was reverence. There was value. Adam had love for his wife. She, he said, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. See, there was that reverence there. We have lost that, especially in America today. We talked about how there's apps that you can, you can sign up for to, to use just to have a sexual encounter with somebody and never even know their real name. Where's the reverence? Where, where's holding that person in a high standard? Where's the love? This isn't how God designed it. This is processed. This has been stepped on. This has been ruined. This has been, this is just crap. It's not the way it was designed. And then we wonder why over half of marriages fail in America today. It wasn't how it was meant to be used. So again, we ask, why is sex such a big deal? Why, why care how it's used? Because we forget the truth. And why it was created, like I said, some people don't even know that God created it. And so when we forget these truths, we strip away the value of the gift. We misuse it, we overuse it, and we ultimately ruin the gift and the purpose that it was created for. The reason... Noah ood and odd at this pineapple is, is because we, we have lost that, that desire, that, that value of this pineapple. And it's, it's incredible because it's, it's the same fruit as back then. Nothing's changed about this pineapple. Just the way you view it. That's the only thing that's changed. 
So my question is, if you rewound, if you got in your time machine and you went back in your DeLorean to, to, to this time, how were marriages back then? How were they viewed? You weren't allowed to leave your spouse. Divorce wasn't a thing. Divorce was something that you went through publicly and were publicly humiliated for going through. That it wasn't something that you just, ah, we can get a divorce, nothing bad, nothing, oh well. It was something that, that, that nobody, no woman wanted to go through, no man wanted to go through because it was something, you stayed together. They had reverence for marriage back then. You worked through your issues. You got along. Oh, you don't like your wife? Well, tough, you're stuck with her. And you got to work it out. Somewhere down the line, it became okay. Instead of working at this, we can just call it quits. Good luck. Have fun. And you move on. We talked about this when we talked about uh, the marriage portion of this, which I believe was last week. And we talked about how this isn't right. Sex goes hand in hand with marriage. Why? Because you're only supposed to experience sex when you're married. Adam and Eve only experienced it after their marriage with God present and and ordaining that marriage. So if we misuse it, again, getting ahead of myself. So why is one fruit better than the other? And we talked about it. It's because one was treated with respect. One was treated with love. And the other was treated with the consumer in mind. The difference between these very two pineapples up here today, the one in a can and the one uh, sitting here, whoever harvests this pineapple, they take great care. Because they don't want to bruise them. They want to present them in a way that, that they take care pride in their product, and, and they're, they're very cautious of the things. The other hand, we have the canned version, which is how many can we pump through in the cheapest fashion? Do you hear this? There's sloshing going around in here. You know why? Thank you, Lord, for the rain. Uh, the reason you hear that liquid is because for packaging reasons, but also it's a filler. It's to make you feel like you got more than you actually did. So it's a lie. There's lies in that can. There's ways to preserve it so that it can last longer. And do they do these things because they care about you? No, they don't. What do they care about? Their bottom line. How much money can they make? How long can they keep the product because it's a perishable item? How long can I keep it on the shelf because then there's a more chance that somebody's going to spend money on it? They don't care about you. So this one product was made with the consumer in mind. And so my question is, how do we as Americans use sex? Are you using it with the correct reverence, with the, with the love of God and understanding how it was made, looking into why we're not supposed to do it before marriage? Are you, do you care at all about that? Or are you thinking about the consumer, which is you and your sinful heart? Because one will lead you to a path of destruction. One is going to burn you and going to hurt you, and it's not going to help you. It is going to hurt your relationships. It is going to rip you apart, and it is going to cause pain. I promise you that. And again, one of the things I have a problem with when people talk about this subject is teachers, um, especially pastors in the past, And even some parents, when they talk about this, they use this topic of sex in a fear-based message. And I really hope that this is anything but that. Because it's not something to be afraid of. Because people get awkward talking about this subject. I don't know why, but they do. Because it's uncomfortable to talk about. I can't wait to have this conversation with the next generation that comes up into my group because this is something I care about. This is something God cares about. And so what they do is they say, don't have sex before marriage 
or else. Or else what? Or else, you know, they, they go over the diseases. They go over all the problems that come with it. They, come, they, they, they hit you with reasons as to not, and they scare you into doing what they said. Guys, listen to me tonight. I love you. I love you all too much to lie to you like that. I am not going to sit up here and try and scare you. I am lovingly just presenting the truth of God's word to you. I am telling you why it was created, how it was meant to be used, and why we as Christians believe that you need to do this the right way. And some of that, yes, I have to talk about the consequences that come with it. Because when mistreated, sex can ruin everything. And we're going to get into it again. I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's start a fire. Something you probably were not going to think you would hear tonight. Um, so now I shouldn't have to say this, but fire is dangerous. Okay. Fire is, is, is something that is difficult Fire is something, uh, what, what three things, not the only three, but what three most important things does a fire need? Anyone? Oxygen is one. Heat is another. And the third? Fuel. Oh, look at you guys. All right. My pyro's in the house. All right. So, we have some very, very dry logs that I just put on a, uh, a porch fire pit here. And so if I was going to light this, who would get, see, you know, when I thought I would light a match and hold it over this, you guys would be a little more, a little more excited. Okay. All right. Well, maybe, maybe I'm not doing this right. So let me bring let me bring the fire down closer to you guys. What if what if I put it what if I took the fire? Now you said it needed full you said it needed fuel, right? So if I put more logs on, it'll be a bigger fire. It'll be easier to light. Thank you, my love. Throw that last one on there for me. Now they're they're standing by. So now fire's a lot closer to you. Fire's a lot closer. You guys are more still, still not as nervous, still not as nervous as I thought you would be. So, so my question, so my question is if I took gasoline, and we put, and we put gasoline and we put gasoline on the fire. Would you go out? No, I'm not that crazy to put gasoline on a log. Are you guys out of your mind? I would get fired and be on the news. But now, listen to me. As the demonstration went on, why did you guys get more nervous and more excited as this went on? The reason is because this was safe. And every time I moved the fire closer, I took restrictions off it, and it got more dangerous. There was a more likelihood something was going to go wrong. And when I introduced the fake gasoline, there was almost a certainty that something bad was about to happen, something dangerous. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the perfect analogy for sex. Over in this corner, you have something that contains it. You have restrictions on it that I literally could have lit this on fire and it wasn't going to burn the stage. It wasn't going to do anything. It would have been fine. That's why nobody was weirded out or nobody was concerned the minute I lit that match. In fact, you take this outside, put it in a well-ventilated area, it's something beautiful. 
We sit around it. We cook around it. We want to be around it. We want to enjoy it with other people. We want to sit there and, and sing songs and make marshmallows. We did it at our camp out, and it was beautiful because it's, it's something that is beautiful and meant to be enjoyed. But when I moved it down, I took restrictions off it. Now there's nothing controlling it. It can go anywhere it wants. And that's why the people in the front row got a lot more nervous than anybody else because they were the first ones that were going to be affected by this. Then when I put gasoline, you guys pulled out your phones and started videotaping because guess what was going to happen? We were thinking, Scott's this crazy, and I love that you believe that I am because trust me, next time we're having gas. I asked my wife, and she put a no on it. But I'm telling you now, I'm telling you now, this is what we do. Well, well, what if I love the person, but I just do it when we're engaged? We'll do it, we'll do it before marriage, but, but we'll be engaged, and it's only going to be with this person. I'm going to marry him anyway, and we we'll still love each other. Taking restrictions off of how God intended sex to be used. Then it's, well... What if he's my boyfriend or my girlfriend for, for 10 years and we just don't want to get married? We just don't think we need a legal piece of paper and we don't want to go. It's such a hassle and you got to spend so much money. So, so we're going to enjoy sex before marriage, but in our hearts we're married. Move it to the floor. And now it's a lot closer. Pulling more restrictions off of it to the point where gasoline is now where we're at. Where sex doesn't mean anything. It's, it's, it's just a physical act. There is no spiritual aspect to it. It wasn't created by God. It's something that feels shameful about. And do you see the issue with this? In taking something that is beautiful, something that is awesome and, and enjoyable and meant to be shared with one person, the opposite sex of you, your husband, your wife, and supposed to be enjoyed and, and is beautiful and everything that's right. And we get to throwing gas on a fire because we mistreat it. The reason God put restrictions on sex is not to be mean to keep you from having fun, it's to protect you. It's the same reason that when I went to Home Depot and bought a chainsaw, it came with instructions and a way to put it together and a way to use it and do's and don'ts. Do, do the people at Black & Decker think I'm an idiot? Do they think that I don't know how to use a chainsaw and that, that they know better than me and Black & Decker's just being a jerk who hates Scott? No. They don't want me to cut my leg off. They want me to be using this product in a way they intended it to be used because they knew if they didn't write this manual, if they didn't write these instructions, Scott eventually was going to take that chainsaw and kill himself because, Lord have mercy, I've come close. They knew if they left this dangerous thing with me alone that my sinful heart would take over and end up hurting if not killing me. Does this sound familiar? The reason the Bible has rules and restrictions on sex is not to be mean. It's so that you don't take this and ruin your life with it. Scott, I don't believe that sex ruins lives. Talk to any divorced person. Anyone who's ever been cheated on. Think about right now in your head, if you're a boy, imagine your wife. If you're a girl, imagine your husband that you love more than anything, that, you, that, you've, that you've been married to for 25 years. You have three kids, Sarah, Angel, and, and Jeremiah, and, and you love them more than anything. You build a family. Keep that, keep that love in your head. Now imagine that person cheats on you and goes and sleeps with somebody else. That, that twinge of pain, that twinge of anger that you just felt, and you all did, I don't care who you are, would be magnified by a billion if it were real. 
I love my wife more than anyone. I have such reverence for that woman. I only have eyes for that woman. I will only ever love that woman because she is mine. We are one before the Lord. And I'm telling you now, I would lose my mind. I would burn the building to the ground and I would kill everyone involved if she ever slept with somebody else. She knows that. I told her that before I married her because I wanted her to understand what she was entering into. And you know what that crazy lady said to me? Ditto. She said, don't you ever look at somebody else because I will lose my mind. It is something that me and her share. I will never share that gift with another person ever as long as I live. Well, what if she, God forbid, would pass away? You're 30 years old. I don't care. I don't care if I spend the next 80 years alone and by myself because I will see her again. This isn't the end. I'll meet her again in heaven. I'll get to be with her one day. So I can't, I can't be faithful for 80 years and, and, and wait till I get to be with her again? Come on, guys. This is, this is what the world does, is they try and take a precious gift from God and manipulate and twist his words into making it so that God's a mean guy with a magnifying glass trying to burn ants, and you're the ants. People have always done this with the Bible. Does God have wrath? You betcha. But guess what? It's just. It's right. His wrath is justified. Because we are, let me help you say it, wrong. When you're a Christian, you admit that I'm wrong. I am a Christian, and I admit that Scott is a sinner, that Scott is a broken man, that Scott needs a savior, that Scott has issues in his life to this day that need to be worked out by God the Father. I understand that. But see, what people try and do is they keep trying to take God and make him into this mean guy who doesn't care about you, who just wants to punish you, who wants to poke fingers at you, tell you not to do this because I don't want you to have fun. Are you out of your mind? Well, Christians are weird because they don't drink. Yeah, trust me, had problems with alcohol. It was not. I thought it was fun at the time, but guess what? It did nothing but try and destroy my life. And it was only by the grace of God that i given it up and that I won't ever go back because I know there's more joy in following God than there is in following the world. Because I tried living their way, and guess what it left me? with a broken heart, with emptiness, with hollow promises all around me, no love in my life, no, no hope, no reason to get up. Then when I gave all those fun things up, those things that God was being mean about, and I started living in a right way, guess what entered my heart? The joy of the Lord. That even in my struggles, even in the moments where me and my wife don't have a house and we're struggling to, to see the light at the end of the tunnel, we're struggling. Nine months we've been going through this, this hell of trying to find a house and it's, it's been taxing. We have have a child now that we can't provide for and it's hard. But guess what I find? Joy. Well, you can't find joy. You're, you're struggling in life. Yes, I can because I believe in the Almighty because the Holy Spirit fills me with joy. He brings me peace. He brings me strength. He renews me. Do you see how this works? When you live... As God intended Adam and Eve to, when you live in the righteous way, when you try your best, you're not going to be perfect. You're not going to succeed all the time. Trust me, been there, done it, still doing it. Not successful every time. But when you try with all your heart and all your might to chase after God, to live in the way he wants you to, guess what you will find? I promise you. You will find a better life. You will find joy. You will find peace. You will find him. And only, only when you find Jesus can you experience what true love is. Can you understand what true happiness is, what true joy is. Guys, I've been running and gunning for a long time. I, I used to always say when I was, when I was 20, 
I lived more in 20 years than most people have in 60, and it was very true. I used to do crazy things. I used to have so many stories. I still have the stories, and I, I, I've, I've done the craziest and, and, and just most outlandish things. I love to create memories, and there's nothing wrong with living like that. But guess what? I have so much more joy being your pastor and following the crazy calling that God has put on my life. I've had more joy doing that than any of the years I ever did living in Scott's way. God's way is so much better. He took me overseas. He made me a missionary. I got to spend and speak in time with people and speak into their lives who didn't even speak the same language as me. And I got to live with them for four months. And I got to live with in uh, the go with the church in Costa Rica. And the Lord just put it on my heart to go with Pastor Clay to to uh, Kenya next year. And so I'm going to want to go to Africa and and go over there and do all these crazy things that he's doing. And I just seen he was in a in a maximum security prison. And I was like, God, this is going to be awesome if you take me. They're like, I can't wait. The crazy things he calls me to do. I have so many more stories now than I did living in my ways. Because life is better following the call of God and following his will than spending time fighting against him. You want to misuse sex? You want to misuse marriage? You want to misuse your relationships? Good luck. I, I, and I, I say that with as much love as I can muster for you because I really mean it. Good luck. There is no one more powerful. There is no one more capable than God the Father. And when you come against him, when you want to fight against him, that wrath that we talked about, that is justified. And it's coming. But I want you to understand, if you're somebody who's mistreated it and never knew this, or even if you knew it and God's convicting you tonight, I don't want to do that anymore, Scott. Well, what if, what if I've already made the mistake? What if I've already messed up? Okay. Jesus loves you. No, no, you don't understand. I've, I've, I've already had sex. Jesus loves you. No, but, but I want to do it again. Jesus loves you. You can't run far enough to get out of his love. You can't do anything that is going to disgust him enough that he won't love you. He loves you more than you will ever know, and he has saved you. He wants you to accept that saving, and when you do, he will wash you clean. He will make everything new. Now, does that mean you are not still going to have to answer for the consequences that come along with sin? Absolutely not. I still have to answer for the consequences of my days of drinking and alcohol abuse. I still deal with issues because of that. It doesn't wipe away the consequences. It doesn't wipe away the things that come with it. But when you believe and God washes clean your sins, the ultimate consequence, which is, I don't get to go to heaven anymore. That's wiped clean. God took our place. Jesus took our place when he died on that cross. And I want you to know that every marriage, that every sexual history can be restored through the blood of Jesus Christ. The main thing is that when you bring your heart, and I don't care what it is, whether it's sex or, or stealing or lying or whatever issue you're dealing with right now that your heart wants to keep doing perpetually. I don't care what it is. Think of it right now. When you bring it to God and say, Lord, I lay it down at your feet. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm asking you to forgive me. The, the main thing you got to remember is that this pivotal moment moving forward, you are not to do it again. You are to turn from your sinful ways and try to do better. Now, if it happens, that's where God's grace comes in again. You've got to bring it back to him, repent, and ask him to wash it clean again, and just keep going and trying your best to do better. But where the real action comes in is do you want to do better? There's many people who call themselves Christians that my heart absolutely breaks for. Because they're not. 
They don't care about Jesus. They don't care about the gospel. They, they don't care. They use him like a bumper sticker. I can go do what I want. I can live how I want. I can say what I want. And all I got to do is at night say, thank you, Jesus. Chalk it up. Put it on my tab. You paid for it. That's not repentance. That's you being a jerk and trying to cheat Jesus like a genie. That's not, that's not following God. That's you trying to get out of hell with, with, with a, a half-baked excuse of a life. That's not, that's not Christianity. That's not following God. That's, that's you mistreating God. But when you give him your heart and you say, Lord, I love you more than anything. I want to do better. Guess what happened? When I started to believe and I started being convicted by the Holy Spirit about my drinking. Did it the next day go away? And I, I had no desire anymore. I had no need. And I just I just was perfect Scott. No. I would drink and then I would find myself sitting there and going, how can I do this? God, I'm sorry. And I would just be overwhelmed with a conviction. And it was the, it was the Holy Spirit. It was the Lord saying, Scott, I've created you to do better. I've created you for more. I want to use you in better ways than you can imagine. And over time, my heart changed and I wanted to do better. And he blessed the desires of my heart to the moment where he gave me a, a dream that I awoke. And I, I, I held scripture to the dream and the Lord explained the dream. And the dreams just made a clear enough example to me that in that moment, at I think it was at five o'clock in the middle of the night. After, after reading this dream and, and going over it with God, that I sat there and I made a covenant with the Lord that not a drop of alcohol ever again will willingly touch my lips. And I made that covenant and I said, but God, I can't do this alone. It's too strong for me. The temptation is too much. I've tried quitting in the past and it hasn't worked. And the only difference that I believe that this time is going to be different is because I'm going to do it with you. I want your strength. I want your capability. Just forget Scott. The next time the desire rises up in my heart, I want you to take it from me. I want you to pull me out of that situation. And it was in that moment that everything changed because that's true repentance. He got all of my heart. I withheld nothing from him. Do you see the difference? So if you're struggling with something, bring it to God, but don't bring it to him if you're not ready to let go of it. If you actually don't want to change, Bringing it to him is not going to make a difference if you're still holding on to it and refusing to change your way. That's not repentance. God's not going to pry it out of your hand. That's not how he works. Do you know why Jesus came and did not spend any time talking and preaching to the high ups and, the, and the, the, the people with their noses 10 feet in the air and the famous people? It's because none of them wanted to hear what he had to say. So he said, okay, fine. I'll go talk to the people who actually care, who want to hear me. So he went to the people, the lower people, the people everybody miscounted, the, the, the misfits, the prostitutes, the, the tax collectors, all the, all the outcasts, the leopards. He went to the city gates, and that's where he would preach. That's who, who he talked to, because guess what those people recognized that the highfalutin people didn't? That they were in need of a savior that they were wrong, that they had sin in their life, that they were broken. If you don't think you need a savior, you need to look at your heart because you're not admitting something to yourself. You can't, you can't sin and tell me it doesn't feel wrong. It does. And every single person who ever has done it, now, you can get good at it. 
you can get good at sinning to the point where it becomes perpetual and becomes a knee-jerk reaction. And that's what people do today. They'll tell you there's, there's, there's sex therapists, there's, there's all these people who will tell you, uh, sex can be physical. Well, tell me about your first time. Tell me about the very first time. Do you remember it? Every single person remembers their first time. You know why? Because it was the very first time they entered it. It was before they were good at it. It was before they got good at, at stuffing their feelings and, and getting away from that guilt and shame that came with sin. And I'm talking about sex before marriage, not after. Because after, when you use it in the correct way for the first time, there is no guilt. There is no shame because it was you used it in the way God meant you to. But if you ask them, what about your first time? There's a spiritual aspect that comes in. There's emotions that come into play. Now, over time, can you get good at that? It's just like thieves. It's just like stealing. I can get good at stealing. First time I ever stole something, I'll never forget it. I stole a candy bar from my brother, and it was... Uh, my parents were very upset with me, and I lied about it, which made ten th everything ten times worse. But when I stole that candy bar, I knew it was wrong. I immediately had an issue with it. But over time, I got better at stealing things. And guess what? I didn't have those emotions as much. You can get good at sin. And you can get good at telling yourself it's not wrong and it's not a problem. But when you do that, you get further away from accepting Jesus. Because you start getting it in your head that I'm okay. I'm a good person compared to who? You want to tell me you're a good person compared to Hitler? Probably a good person. Have you killed anyone? Nope. So you're above him compared to Jesus? Well, it's not fair because, you know, he wasn't just just God. Okay, what about Peter? What about Moses? What about Martin Luther King? You compare yourself to those guys? You just kind of slinked down a little bit, didn't you? So saying I'm a good person doesn't get you out of things because who are you comparing yourself to? And that's what the Bible does. It helps us understand that our benchmark the hurdle that you got to clear is being like Jesus. He was perfect. That's why he got into heaven. So what about Scott? Well, I fell short. I screwed it up. I made decisions that broke my relationship with God the Father. But what does Jesus go and do? He takes his, his, his self and he comes over and he says, I'll take your spot in line. Go take mine. But God, I don't deserve that. But I want to take it for you. I want to make a way so that there's, there's a way for you to get back into heaven, to have a relationship with God, so that you can experience all these things, so that you can be used again by God, so that you can have hope and a future. That's what Jesus does. And sex is just a small portion of that. Guys, I'm telling you now. One of the lies from the pit of hell is that sex is everything. Sex is this thing that is that is magical and is life changing, and it's and it's never you you'll never uh, uh, want to live in a in a life before it. And it that's lies. Is it amazing? Yes. Is it something that's beautiful? Yes. But you know what makes it beautiful? Using it in the way God intended, experiencing. All that he had created for me. It's something to be held in reverence to. It's something to protect. It's something to have value on. You only get to give it away once. Before it becomes used. Please let that sink. You can only have one first time. Put value on it. Just like God has told you. The Bible says that a single man gives 
all of his attention, a righteous single man, a godly single man, gives all of his attention to God and chasing after God and his will, but a married man has split focus that he chases after God, but also has to tend to the things of this world like his wife and his children. I never understood that until I got married and had kids. I used to run there at the end where I gave my heart to the Lord and really let him in and change my life. Dude, I was running and gunning like never before. I was chasing him down. I was serving in here. I was serving out there. I was going overseas. I only had what God had on my mind. But when I got married, my focus split. Now I'm chasing after God, but I'm also worried about my wife. That's being a good husband. And the Bible's saying that's not wrong. But what he's saying is when you're single, men and women, because it goes on to say the exact same thing about women, when you're single, stop looking to the other side of marriage. Stop worrying about sex. Stop worrying about having somebody uh, to hold you at night and to be around and to share your life with. Stop. Don't look over there yet. Chase after God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Because when you do that, you'll find the gifts that he wants to give you. When I finally chased after God with my whole heart and with all my focus, that's when I met my wife. And you know where I met her? In school to get my credentials to become a pastor. Single people, which I think is everyone in here. Let me help you out in life. If you go to parties and to a bar, guess what you're not going to find? Usually, not, not 100% of the time, but I'm going to say high 95s. You know what you're not going to find? Godly people who, who hold God in reverence. I kept going to nightclubs and bars trying to find a godly woman. You know where she was? In a godly place. I can take my fishing rod up to Blue Marsh and fish for great white sharks all I want. It's water. It could hold it. It's possible. Somebody could buy a great white shark and put it in there. It's very possible. Lake's big enough. Very, very unlikely. So I could spend my entire life up there fishing in the wrong place for the wrong thing. If you want a godly person, you know where you're going to find them? In the house of God. Makes sense. Let that be a guide to you. I wish somebody told me that earlier. It's okay to find relationships in this church. It's okay to find relationships on missions trips. It's okay to, to, to find people that you like in those places. Because guess what? Those people are probably better. Not always, but probably going to be better people and more suited for you than outside. It is my heart to have you guys understand these things. Sex is not bad. It's not evil. But it will hurt. You, a partner, and the love that you have for them, and your future, if it's mistreated, and you don't hold value, who cares? How you use it, remember that was one of the questions? There's two main answers to that. The first one is, you should care. Because the Bible says that, that this sin, adultery, sex before marriage, this sin is one of the only that are against you. That this sin is going to hurt my soul, is going to hurt me. If I murder somebody, I hurt somebody else. Didn't hurt me at all. This sin hurts me. And the second answer to that question, who cares? God does. Because he created this with a purpose and with instructions. And when you try and say you know better, and you can use it however you want, you're telling God he doesn't know what he's doing doesn't like that. It hurts him because he knows it's going to hurt his children. He loves you so much, guys. He loves you so much. He did not 
He does not withhold things from you to hurt you, to make sure you're not having fun. He does it so that you won't hurt yourself, so that you can live a healthy, happy life, so that you can be married for a long time. People think me and my wife are crazy because we don't keep tabs on each other. I'm not worried she's out there cheating. You know why? She waited 24 years for me. And so I have no reason to be worried. I trust that woman with my whole heart. And the reason is, she waited for me. And she does the same for me because I waited for her. Be able to say that to your husband. Be able to say that to your wife. I waited for you because I cared enough about you to wait. I wanted our marriage to last, so I waited. Father, I thank you for tonight. Lord, I thank you for the love that you have for us. I thank you for this gift of sex that you gave us to experience and to use in the way that you intended. Lord, I thank you for that beauty and for that, that oneness that I get to be with my wife, Lord, and that I get to experience as your child. Father, I just pray over every heart in here, Lord, that you would help them to understand the rules and the regulations that you have put on our lives. And Lord, help us to understand that it wasn't out of malicious intent, that it was because you love us. Help us truly to understand the love that you have for us, Lord. Help us to comprehend as much as we can. Father, help us to feel that. And Lord, I just pray that as these young people grow and as they get older and as they move forward in relationships and as they start to date and as they start to, again, become young adults, I pray that, Lord, you would bring this back to their mind in the moments of temptation, that you would bring back the word of God to their mind and that they would remember this moment where they said, I want to follow God with all my heart. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you for all that you do. And it's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen.